girl in my late 20s, and I just want to tell all the other females out here, do not get a job as a delivery driver, ever. It puts you in some seriously dangerous positions, and I learned that to my ultimate detriment. And the thing is, I kind of figured that out before I took a job as one, and I just didn't think it could ever happen to me. I'd considered myself tough, street smart, and definitely not the kind of girl who exudes a sense of vulnerability. But that didn't help, and it didn't save me when it mattered most. So like I said, I knew working for DoorDash would pose its own set of unique problems, but as you can probably guess already, my financials were in such a dire state after my business went under that frankly, I didn't have much of a choice. It was either swallow my pride and don the red hoodie or risk having to move back in with my parents back in Connecticut. Don't get me wrong, I love my mom and dad, but I didn't move to New York just to run back home with my tail between my legs when things got tough. It actually turned out to be an okay job at first, but then came an order on Friday, February 11th, taking a pizza from Patrizia in Williamsburg to a place on Eckford Street up in Greenpoint. I rode over, picked it up, rode up to Eckford, then found the address. I messaged the guy saying, I'm here, because I couldn't tell which apartment he was in. He just gave a door number, and then he came down to get it. The guy had to be 40-something, slick back hair, mustache, and thick black-rimmed glasses. Worst thing was, he came down in a robe, stained vest, boxers, and gripper slippers. He didn't seem dangerous, not at first, anyway. He was just a creep, because his literal first words to me were, Oof, you're cute. Cute is the last word I'd use to describe myself, and the guy in the robe was the last person I'd ever take that kind of compliment from. So needless to say, the displeasure must have seriously registered in my face, because the next thing he says is like, Someone having a bad day, huh? The retort came to me in an instant. Not until I ran into you, but I kept myself from saying it. Nothing good would have come from insulting the guy, especially not when my tip was on the line, so I kept my mouth shut and, in a way, it paid off. You know, you should smile more. That look doesn't suit you. He said, and as much as it made my blood boil, I still kept my mouth on lockdown. For a while, I was glad I did because, as insane as it sounds, the guy took out two twenties from his wallet and was like, Here, this'll put a smile on your face, and held both bills out to me. But when I went to grab them, not once, not twice, but three times, then on the third time he was all like, There's more where that came from if you want to come inside and enjoy some pizza with me. Only when I went to walk away did he laugh this awful, obnoxious laugh before, like, Hey, I'm kidding. Come on, get your tip, cutie. I almost balked at the comment, but I did go back. I'm ashamed to say it, but I needed the money. You know, I still do, even. And I still needed it on the Sunday, the day before Valentine's Day, when I saw that same job pop up on my DoorDash app. It was a pizza from Patrizia. Same toppings too, heading to the exact same address. All I could think of was that $40 tip and how Valentine's Day would be a lot less embarrassing if I could actually split the restaurant bill with my boyfriend. He had insisted on being chivalrous about the whole thing and covering the bill himself, but I'm really not that kind of girl. I don't care who you are, I pay my way in the world. So I took the job and went through the motions again to Patricia's, to the apartment, and to his door. Again, he's cracking jokes when he sees me, wishing me a happy Valentine's Day and asking if I had anyone to spend it with. I told him yes, I did, and I'd appreciate it if he'd kept things strictly business. At least that time, he'd bothered to put some shorts on, and the lack of robe gave him a distinctly less snobbish appearance. But I did notice one thing that I wasn't quite expecting... He was wearing boots, like combat boots, and they were actually tied. Again, I gave him his pizza, only that time, it wasn't just two 20s that he took out from his wallet. 
It looked like four or five. Since you're not going to be spending Valentine's with me, I thought you might like to spend this on that special someone. He waved the bills back and forth as he spoke, and it hit me right where it hurt the most. The place that had been keeping me awake at night when the cycling didn't take it right out of me. My money troubles. I reached in to take the bills, this pathetic thank you leaving my lips before I even realized I said it. And that time, he didn't swipe them away like I thought he might. But instead, he did something way, way worse. As my fingers touched the bills, his free hand snapped around my wrist and pulled me forward so hard I completely lost my footing. He was strong, way, way stronger than he looked, and just as I was about to find my feet again, he sent the toe of one of his boots crashing into my stomach. I'd never been kicked like that before. Heck, I'd never been hit like that before. So hard you feel like your internal organs are turning into soup right there in your abdominal cavity. And then he started just dragging me, I guess. All along the corridor of the ground floor. I remember feeling this kind of weird hope that he'd have trouble carrying me up the stairs. That it'd be too awkward and it'd give me a chance to escape. But no. All hope of that was lost when I realized he lived on the ground floor right in the back of the building. No wonder he didn't put his apartment number on his account. He wanted to leave as small a digital footprint as possible. So when it came time to come look for me, he'd have something of a head start. Now, obviously, things worked out okay for me or I wouldn't be here to actually write this. But back on that wooden floor, trying to catch my breath and stand up, it really didn't seem that way. I almost got away as we got to his front door, but... I was wrenched by my arm free and tried scuttling back up the corridor. I felt fingers weaving in with my hair before his grip sent my face smashing into the varnished wooden floorboards. Then as he pulled me back, I felt blood flowing down the back of my throat and down my lips. A lot of it too. My head was spinning and the weirdest thing, I was actually seeing stars, just like in the cartoons. All these little shiny dots dancing around the sides of my vision. I felt far away from my body, real far away, and I thank God I came back to it before he went through with what he intended to do next. All it took was throwing me against his bed, not like on top of his bed, more like with my face resting on the mattress while my knees were on the floor. I knew it was coming next. I could practically smell it on him, and again, I thank God that... He made one giant mistake. He reached around, tried to hook his forearm under my throat. He'd seen that I was a fighter or that at least I was trying to fight and he obviously didn't like that one bit. So in order to make me much more pliable, he tried to choke me out so he could do whatever he wanted. I just remember getting this flash of adrenaline when I realized what was happening and as he tried to slip his forearm under my chin, I sunk my teeth into his flesh and bit down, hard. I didn't have to scream. He did all the screaming for me. His first was like a yelp, followed by a deep growl as he tried to fight through the pain. But as my teeth sank deeper and deeper into his skin and eventually his muscle, the yelp came back again, snowballing into an ear-splitting squeal as I felt the muscle crunch under my teeth, and I do mean crunch. I once took a bite out of a raw chicken sandwich back in Connecticut. Terrible food being just one of the reasons I moved. And whatever half-stoned line cook that made it must have taken out a cutlet too early and when I bit into it, I felt the raw chicken breast softly crunch as my teeth went into it. And let me tell you, it felt the exact same way biting into the raw flesh of that guy's arm. I remember feeling his muscle tearing as he tried to yank his arm away, or maybe I didn't feel it so much as hear it ripping around my teeth. Then, as almost like I heard this little voice of internal monologue saying, Let's go, idiot. He's trying to get free. So I did just that. I opened up my jaw, and suddenly his forearm was out of my mouth, and I couldn't feel any pressure on my back. And that was my window of escape. 
He was still staring at his forearm when I bolted past him, but as I reached the door, I felt a hand grab onto my hair again. It wasn't enough to hold on to me, though. Just a few strands, and as I threw myself forward, thinking not again, I felt the hair rip from my scalp. It's weird because back when I was a kid, my big sister tore a bunch of my hair out one time, and it hurt really bad, but that day... I felt more rip out and I didn't even feel a freaking thing. It's weird what a little adrenaline can do for you, you know? Then I was out in the streets and because people heard the scream or saw the blood around my mouth, they wanted to know what was going on. A girl and her boyfriend wanted to know if I was okay and all I could say was, call the cops, over and over again. And by some miracle, a patrol car actually showed up within 10 or 15 minutes and after I told the cops what happened, they got into the apartment building and presumably went to make an arrest. Then, here's where the whole thing gets weird. The guy wasn't in the apartment. He'd escaped out the rear exit once he'd realized his screaming in my mouth had caused a big commotion. But that's not the weird part. The weird part is there wasn't a single piece of ID in that entire place. No bank cards, no receipts, nothing like that. The DNA they lifted, from my chin no less, matched no one on national databases and the ID the guy had used to rent the apartment was traced back to a dead man in North Dakota who'd apparently never even left his home state, let alone been all the way out to New York City. The cop who told me that was basically only telling me one thing, that there was nothing they could do. They probably weren't going to catch the guy, there was no tracing him anywhere and I should basically just count my blessings that I managed to get away before he did anything permanent. As you can imagine, the investigation into him didn't go anywhere, but I'm definitely not the first woman whose abuser evaded justice in some way, so that I can weirdly come to terms with. The thing that really gets me is how this guy seemed to have covered his own butt from day one, using a false identity, ready to book at a moment's notice, setting up a bank account with someone else's name and social security number. I think I was almost assaulted and maybe even murdered by a guy that's done stuff like that for his entire life. In which case, how many other girls or guys are out there that have suffered through the exact same thing? Or how many times has he burned down his entire identity just to start anew someplace else? How does a person like that manage it? over and over again building their entire existence around their predatory urges. Those are the questions that keep me up at night, but I do have a little piece of solace. Every time that guy looks at his right forearm, every time he takes a shower or rolls up his sleeves or whatever, he sees a little gift I left him. A gift from the girl who made him burn down his whole world. A gift from the girl who got away. Ever since I was a kid, I always wanted a moped, and once I was old enough to drive one, I hashed out a plan with my mom and dad. They'd loan me the grand and a half to buy my preferred model, a 2015 Piaggio Liberty 50cc, and I'd get a job as a delivery driver to pay them back in installments. I remember my dad giving me this big speech and responsibility and work and all this other stuff, like I wasn't going to fulfill my end of the deal but he didn't realize how easy it was going to be for me. I'd have happily driven around London on that thing day after day, so the idea of getting paid for it too, and that was all I ever wanted at that age, and so the moped would literally be paying for itself. Finding a delivery job was easy enough. Well, it was more like two delivery jobs, one in the week, one on the weekends, but it was easy enough. Then, for about six months, I worked five days a week, seven hours a day, enough to make money for myself while being able to pay my parents back in the agreed-upon installments. But little did I know, I wouldn't actually pay off what I owed, because I wouldn't be able to pay it off. And here's why. On Friday night, I was out in deliveries, driving as carefully as I normally did. One minute I was taking a turn down a residential street near Peckham and the next thing I know, 
something slams into the back of my moped. I remember flying over the handlebars in slow motion, seeing the road getting closer and closer and just praying that the impact wouldn't either straight up kill me or break my neck. The impact was horrific, but I didn't directly land on my head. I think I must have done like a half flip in midair or something too, because when I actually came to a stop on the road, the thing that hurt me the most was my right elbow. Then, after that, I remember someone like dragging me off the road by my leg. I know now that you're not supposed to move someone after an accident like that, that moving them can actually do more damage than the accident itself, but in the moment, I thought it was just someone trying to help. It didn't half hurt, but if their intentions were pure, if someone was at least helping me, then that eased my mind a bit, even if it did make my arm hurt even more. I remember saying something like, please call 999, but my words were definitely being muffled by my helmet. That wasn't a huge problem though. I mean, someone will have called 999, even if it was the dozy bugger that smashed into the back of me. But then, and remember, all I can see is what I can see about my visor, I see that I'm being dragged past the pavement and into an alleyway at the side of the road, and that's about the same time that I notice the three or four pairs of feet that seem to be following whoever has dragged me. And that's when I realize something is badly wrong, and that this is no ordinary road accident. Since I was lying on the concrete of the alleyway, with my helmet on, I still couldn't see much, but what I could see was about five pairs of feet surrounding me. I remember saying something like, what's going on? Who are you? And that's when the first kick hit my side. It didn't impact near my broken elbow, but the shock was enough to have it burning with pain, and any other question I had were drowned out by the screams of pain I let out. That's when I heard something like, you honestly think you can do us over, yeah? And another kick came from the other side, completely knocking the wind out of me. Then I heard another voice, one with a northern accent, say, You stole six grand's worth of Eki's mate. You're lucky you're getting a chance to explain yourself. That time I started shouting like, I don't know what you're talking about. But again, my helmet was half muffling my words and the sound of beeping horns from the street did the rest of the muffling. I tried to take my helmet off to at least show them that they had the wrong person. I hadn't so much as had a pint of lager at that point in my life, let alone taken, sold, or stolen any serious drugs. So I knew that getting my helmet off was the quickest way of me getting myself out of trouble. But my arm was in bits, man. And if you've ever tried taking a motorbike helmet off with just one hand before, you'll know how impossible it is unless you get a really good angle on it. And once again, the dragging started. Someone dragged me under my arms and started pulling me further up the alley. All I could do was keep on shouting that this was a mistake and you got the wrong person. But no one seemed to be listening, let alone be able to hear what I was saying. I stopped screaming for a second and actually tried to wrestle myself free, but that was a huge mistake for two reasons. The first being my arm hurt more than ever and the second being that it only provoked more kicks to come from all sides and that when I heard someone saying, did you bring it? And someone else reply, yeah, two bottles. And I remember thinking, bottles? Bottles of what? And then wondering if they were already talking about getting some drinks in after they'd done whatever they were planning on doing with me. But it wasn't bottles of alcohol they were talking about. It was something else entirely. The really frustrating thing, now that I think back on it, is that at no point did they bother taking my helmet off for me. They were so confident that they got whatever thief they were looking for, who must have had a similar moped to me, that they just went for me without so much as a second thought. Then the moment came when I heard one of the blokes say, get him up. I thought that that might be followed by them finally taking my helmet off, but no. I remember them picking me up, like actually picking me up off the ground, and I realized that they were trying to put me in a plastic wheelie bin. I think the adrenaline was really kicking in at that point because as I started to really kick and struggle, I found my arm wasn't hurting as much as it was before. 
I could still feel that it wasn't working properly, and I could even feel the bones or whatever it is in my elbow like grinding together as the guys held me. I really didn't want to go in that wheelie bin. Absolutely no good could have come from getting put in it. But as I struggled, they just held me tighter, with the rest of the blokes coming in to restrain my legs while another punched me as hard as he could in the stomach. I went in easy then, having had the wind completely knocked out of me, and as much as I tried to launch myself out of it using my legs, two lads on either side of me held me down and kept me in the bin. I was completely helpless as I watched one guy take two clear plastic bottles out of his jacket, and when they unscrewed the tops and started emptying the liquid into the bin around me, the smell came up into my helmet and let me know that it was very, very flammable. I started going into overdrive at that point, but then I felt a hand dart under my chin, squeezing my throat under the rim of my helmet, and the more I struggled, the harder it squeezed. I'd never been so scared in my entire life, even to this day. To face your own death like that, to know you're about to die, there's not a feeling in the world like it. But to know it's going to come from being roasted alive inside of a bloody plastic wheelie bin of all things, to know it's going to hurt and hurt and hurt until you finally can't hurt anymore and just switch off, I think that's probably the most terrified a person can ever physically get. I was just praying, please take the helmet off, please take the helmet off. If they take the helmet off, I swear I'll go to church every Sunday until I die. I swear. But then, if they did, would they burn me anyway, knowing I'd end up going to the police and dropping them in it? They'd covered all their faces, so there was a chance that they might let me go, knowing I wouldn't be able to identify them. There was a slim chance. A real slim chance. But this little voice in my head said, That's not going to happen and the thought made me tear up and cry in a way I don't think I'd done since I was a freaking baby. And then, finally, the moment of truth came. I heard the words, get his helmet off, and I felt this tugging sensation with one of them finally pulling the helmet from my head. I must have looked a right state, hair a mess, tears streaming down my face, blubbering, this is a mistake, you've got the wrong person, please don't kill me, you've made a mistake but I'll never forget the pure feeling of relief washing over me when I saw the look in two of the lad's eyes. They might have had their faces covered, but I could see that look of bollocks. We've got the wrong kid. The rest didn't know it though, and the worst thing, the guy with the matches didn't know it was a mistake either, and he was about halfway to striking one of them up before I finally heard one of the wide-eyed guys say, It's not him. What came out next was this weird mix of terror and anger, and I actually threw myself into the words so hard that the wheelie bin ended up rocking when the two guys securing it stepped back with the same horrified look in their eyes, knowing they'd done all that for the wrong bloody person. I told you, I remember screaming. Well, more like screeching now that I think about it. I effing told you you got the wrong effing person. I never stole nothing. I never stole nothing. After that... All the anger that was being focused on me seemed to switch to one of the lads who first looked horrified when the helmet came off. All the others were like, Are you kidding me? You pointed us at the wrong freaking kid? The other guy was then like, I swear it was him. Same scooter, same helmet, same jacket, I swear it was him, oboe, I swear, mate. And this oboe bloke, I guess, obviously the one in charge then full-on punch the other guy in the face, shouting like, keep my name out of your mouth while we work in blood. And then another guy, the one with the northern accent, started saying, we need to get a wiggle on, boys. This is a bad crack, this is. And then the next thing, they're all legging it up back up the alley before I hear screeching wheels and an engine revving. I couldn't actually climb out of the wheelie bin, what with my arm being in a state, but thankfully... I remember looking up to see a woman poking her head out of her back window saying, Police are on the way, love, don't worry. Everything's going to be alright. The police were followed by an ambulance, which took me to a hospital, and one of the nurses must have contacted my parents after taking my details down, because about 10 o'clock, my mom and dad had turned up at St. Thomas's Hospital. 
Mom was in bits and Dad was absolutely raging once he'd heard the full story. How it wasn't just a car accident, but it was like some deliberate attack by drug dealers who'd gotten the wrong guy. He was the one that pushed me to tell the police everything. And I can't believe this now, looking back on it. But at first, I didn't want to, because I was scared that they'd come back knowing I'd grasped them up. They had their own way of dealing with that, though, as when it came to the court date, the police could only get charges on the guy driving the car, or at least the one who admitted to having driven the car. If I had to guess, I'd say that he was the one who'd wrongly ID'd me because if it was me, I'd have had that idiot take all the heat since he was the one who got it wrong. I'll never know for certain, though, because like I said, they all had masks on and I could say the name Obo to the police over and over again, but if the driver wouldn't admit he was there or in the car, there was no touching him. Anyway, as you can imagine, I didn't do much driving after that for a while. As it turns out, that fractured elbow takes quite a while to heal. The only silver lining was that my mom and dad agreed that I didn't have to pay off the rest of my loan, and that they'd use the money I paid them to get my moped repaired. Turned out, they were really proud of me for having stuck to my end of the bargain. And I'd paid off more than half what I owed them anyway, so... All's well that ends well, I suppose. Back when I first moved away for college, my mom and dad bought me this beat-up old Toyota Matrix so I could drive home whenever I'd wanted I grew to hate the old piece of trash after a while, but it got me from point A to B and it helped me get a job as a delivery driver for a pizza place, so I'll always appreciate the gesture. But then one night when I was making a delivery, something happened that meant that from that night on, I never got into the driver's seat of it ever again. So like I said, I'm making deliveries one night and I'd just gotten back into my car after dropping off a bunch of pizzas at an apartment building when I suddenly realized I hadn't locked the passenger side door. And the only reason I realized I hadn't locked the door was because this guy opens up the door and climbs into my car. Then right as I'm about to tell the guy to get out, I see he has a gun. I'm too scared to even say anything and he just points it right in my face and says all out of breath, drive. As I'm pulling into the street, Literally trembling in my seat, I see these two cops sprinting out of an alley in my rear view, and that's when it hits me that they were probably chasing him, and they probably had enough time to call in my license plate. Turns out I was dead right about that, because the next thing I know, I see flashing lights in the rear view. I didn't even have to look over at the guy. I just see him raise the gun up, pointing it at me, and he says, If you stop this car, I'll blow your head off. So I drove, and drove, and kept driving until we were out in the suburbs. The whole time the cops are tailing and they're not shouting like pull over or whatever through their bullhorns or whatever you call it, and I figured it's because they know that the guy basically carjacked me and that there's a hostage situation going on. The whole time the guy's like, drive faster, and all I can say is, I can't, this thing's a piece of trash, if I put my foot down, the engine might freaking give out. So he's content to just delay the inevitable for as long as he could. I don't know exactly how long we were driving because the little digital clock was busted. But after a while we started to see fields and stuff. Then my gas light starts blinking. And I tell the guy that if we don't at least try and stop for gas, that we were eventually just going to come to a rolling stop. He tells me to stop at the next gas station we see, so that's exactly what I do. But not before the guy uses his phone to call 911, telling the operator exactly what's going on, and to tell cops that if they come near the car while we're topping up our gas, he's going to kill the hostage, i.e. me. We eventually pull into this gas station in the middle of nowhere and I'm absolutely terrified, but I ask him if he wants me to get out to top off the tank. He looks around and sees it's one of those pumps that stays locked unless you pay first, so he says no, but he has to think of something out before he lets me get out of the car. 
The cops are keeping a safe distance while this is going on, as they obviously thought the guy was straight up ready to kill me, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't think that too. The whole time they're shouting over their mics like, let the hostage go, we can work something out, and no one has to die over this Malcolm, just surrender and we'll get you help. He's stalling the whole time, pointing the gun to my head every so often to warn the cops off, and I swear that every time he did it, I thought he was going to pull the trigger and just end it. But looking back, if he did that, the cops would have just swarmed the car and shot him, or at least I think they would have anyway. Then there came a point where I could see that he was trying to work out how to get out of the mess he'd gotten himself into. He knew he couldn't get out of the car to get the clerk to unlock the pumps, as they'd ran for cover as soon as they saw that it was a dangerous situation and there was no way for him to get their attention. Then he seemed convinced that if I got out of the car, I'd run off to the cops, like, right away, which, to be fair, was my number one escape plan at the time. He asked me how far we'd go if we just took off with the gas I had in the tank, and I told him, about a mile or two, not far at all. And he lets out this real deep sigh, like a balloon deflating or something, which I suppose was exactly what was happening. He was all out of ideas. He knew this was the end of it. And right then, I realized that was the point that he was at his most dangerous. I was pretty much convinced that I was going to die by that point, having gotten it into my head that the guy was going to just go out in a blaze of glory by shooting me and then unloading the rest of his ammo onto the cops. Then when I heard him say himself, screw it, and he did something to the gun, like cock it or take the safety off, I thought to myself, this is it. This is how my life ends, in a trashy car with some loser maniac. I shut my eyes, felt my hands gripping the steering wheel so hard I could feel it shaking, and then bang. Only a second later, instead of feeling, well, nothing, I found I could open my eyes. But the first thing I saw when I opened them was a few specks of blood on the dash near the passenger side. Then when I turned, I instantly started dry heaving, because the guy had obviously put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger, because there was a ton of blood and chunks of brain matter all over the ceiling of my car. I opened up the door and was puking with my hands raised above my head while I heard the cops shouting, get down on the ground. I had to lie in my own puke, man. Just lie there while they ran over with their guns on me just in case I was somehow in on it. It sounds crazy, but I really didn't mind. Knowing it was all over, that I was safe, well, relatively anyway, it was all gravy by that point. Like I don't even think I can really describe that kind of relief in actual words. I literally felt high off of it. You see and hear about people crying in the aftermath of stuff like that, and I guess that's just how they deal with the emotion. But to me, it kind of felt like I'd won something. Like I'd beat the carjacker by surviving or whatever. Anyway, I better sign off before this starts sounding too abstract, but I can definitely say I wouldn't wish that kind of experience on anyone. Ever. Let me tell you of how I came to be scared of dogs. I used to deliver pizzas for a living. Heck, I used to do a lot of things before my last delivery. Now I don't do much of anything at all and I live on disability. Or rather, I try to live on the meager amount that the SSA allows me to have. I have flashbacks, I have nightmares, and sometimes just the sound of barking or yelping can trigger some severe anxiety attacks all because of a freaking dog. So, like I was saying there, I used to deliver pizzas for a living here in Minnesota, often to the more rural areas too. I mean real rural areas, the kind of driving distance where the old 45 minutes or it's free kind of deal just couldn't apply. Nowadays it's a standard, but out here in the Gopher State, I think we sort of pioneered that old 
pop it back in a hot oven for three minutes thing just so we wouldn't have to deal with a bunch of complaints. But anyway, as I was saying, real rural areas, so I deliver to farmhouses, big old places in the middle of nowhere with these real long driveways. This one time, I roll up to the gate to find its lock with this big old chain and padlock, so there was no getting into the place without getting out of my car and hopping the fence. Obviously, that was no problem at all, just the kind of thing you had to get used to out there in the sticks. So I clamber over and start walking up the pathway towards this place with my thermal bag slung over my shoulder. Then, right as I get within about 50 feet of the front door, this dog appears out of nowhere, rushes up to me, and starts barking loud enough to wake the dead. I was pretty freaked out and backed off a few feet from it, and luckily it just kept a distance at first while it carried on barking at me. I'm giving all the usual nice talk, saying good doggy, good boy, I'm friendly, all that jazz, when the owner of the house suddenly appears in the doorway and calls the thing off. They were real nice about the whole thing and apologized a whole bunch, saying that they hoped I wasn't too spooked by the whole thing. I told her no, that defensive animals were a hazard of the job, and that I certainly wouldn't hold it against them or the pooch, especially since it was only trying to protect its family. Secretly, I'm actually kind of loved it when stuff like that happened. Anything to earn myself a few extra bucks and tips, you know what I mean? Anyway, I get just that. A handsome little sorry bonus on top of my thank you for driving all the way out here tip. Then as I'm counting up the bills, I hear the dog start up again with its barking as I'm walking away. I didn't really know dog breeds all that well, so at the time I had no idea what kind it was. It was only later that I found out it was a kind of bulldog slash pit bull crossbreed. Picture a huge pair of jaws on legs and you pretty much have it figured out. So like I said, I'm counting the bills walking up the driveway and since I figured the grumpy old thing was all bark and no bite, I'm getting a little sassy on my way out. Ah, shut up you old mutt. I tell him to buzz off, that kind of thing, but the further up the driveway I get the louder and more savage this thing was barking. I mean, it sounded positively beside itself by the time I reached the old iron gate to the driveway, and I was honestly real glad I could just drive away because the intensity of the barking really was starting to spook me by that point. But then, I actually tried hopping the fence to get back to my car, and suddenly, the barking stopped. It was replaced by the sounds of paws rushing against grass and dirt, and as I was climbing... I turned my head ever so slightly to see it coming at me out of the corner of my eye. That was followed by one of the most intense pains I've ever had to suffer through, as the dog sunk its teeth into the back of my left calf. I let out this rip roar of a scream, feeling all these pointy little bone daggers stabbing their way into my flesh. Then I made the mistake of thinking that if I had tried to tug my leg up away from the dog I might let go. Jesus, was I wrong, and the pain that gave me was just on another level. On top of that, because the dog felt me trying to pull away, it pulled back harder, and because it was literally pulling me by the meat of my leg, I had basically no choice but to let go of the fence and try to backtrack closer to the dog to stop the pain. But the act of letting go of the fence and stepping off and back meant that I ended up totally collapsing to the ground and that meant I was at the complete mercy of the dog. I suppose I should be thankful that it didn't end up really savaging me, like switching up from my leg to biting at my face or neck or anything like that. Instead, it just kept its jaws clamped on the meat of my calf like a vice grip. I just kept screaming and screaming and reaching around so I could hit the dog or poke at one of its eyes or something, literally anything to get it off of me. I'd never want to hurt an animal under any other circumstances, I swear to God. But in that moment, I couldn't think of anything else to get it off of me. But then, if you picture it, because the thing was attached to the back of my leg and just wouldn't let go, there was no way for me to turn round enough to be able to reach its head. I realized in that moment, as I tried and failed to gouge its eyes or pull at its ears the only thing that was going to save me would be screaming at the top of my lungs for help. Ah, 
One quick point to address before I continue. A lot of people have asked me why I didn't just grab my cell phone out of my pocket to call 911 or whatever. That's because I'd left it in the cup holder, just like I always did. All my drops tended to be pretty quick, even if they did come with the odd obstacle, and because this was way back when cell phones were pretty chunky, I found it was quicker to just hop out without bothering to ram my cell into my jeans pocket while the pizza got even colder. So that's why I didn't, and it ended up being a huge mistake because if I'd bothered to inconvenience the customer a little, maybe I'd have gotten help faster than it arrived. As I was saying, all I could do was just scream and scream and hope the people in the house I just delivered to didn't have their TV turned up too loud. Thankfully they didn't and it was only after maybe a minute or two of me screaming that the owners ran out to help me. I honestly thought it would be over by that point. That the nice lady would just be able to call her dog off and I'd have a few nasty scars at best. But she couldn't. She couldn't call it off, no matter how much she begged or pleaded that thing to get off me. It just wouldn't slacken its jaw one bit. I had no idea of this at the time, but the man of the house had seen what was going on from the front door and was already on the line with 911 by the time his wife even reached me. But she was also accompanied by her teenage son, and it was his proposed solution that I think might have done even more damage to my leg than the dog. As the mom is shouting, Jiffy, yes, its name was Jiffy, please leave him be, Jiffy, please, please let the man go. The kid thought it was a good idea to just grab the dog around its body and try to yank the thing off of me. I think maybe he just thought it had a grip of my jeans or that it would just let go if he physically tried removing it. But even with me begging him not to pull in the dog, that's exactly what he did. And I literally felt muscle being torn from bone as he yanked it backwards. The mom was shouting, no, 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 Michael, stop. By that point, as she could see the damage it was doing to my leg, which was just a hunk of chewed up meat by that time, all I could do was scream and scream and scream some more. And by that point, all this involuntary religious stuff was coming out of my mouth. I never really believed in God. I've been sort of an atheist for as long as I've been able to hold a thought in my head, but in that moment, it just came out of me. All this stuff, I didn't even know what was inside of me. Oh God, please God help me, holy Jesus, please save me, please God, please hear me God. It feels almost embarrassing to say that to myself now, but it's the truth. Anyways, as I'm in the middle of practically speaking tongues, the man of the house ran out to meet us. I remember shouting at him to get a gun, get your gun, please get a gun. But he didn't have one. Instead, he actually had an idea that would get his dog off of me without having to kill it. He basically put the thing in a headlock and choked it until it couldn't breathe anymore. Only then did it actually let go of me. As he dragged it away and held it tight in both arms, I looked back to see that the dog's entire face as well as the man's arms were completely covered in blood. Then I looked back to see what kind of condition my calf was in and because it was still covered with my jeans, I couldn't actually see how much damage had been done. It was just a mass of shredded denim and fresh blood, and it still had some kind of shape to it, so, like I said, I figured I just had some pretty nasty scarring after having my leg wrapped in bandages for a while. I'm no doctor. I had no idea how severe the damage was, and by the time the EMT showed up, I'd lost so much blood that I wasn't really thinking properly. I thought everything was going to be okay, that I just had a bad accident or something that I'd be out of the hospital in a day or two. That turned out to be very far from the truth. I remember finally realizing how serious it was when the doctors told me that I would be going into surgery soon and that they'd try their best to save my leg. I remember thinking, what do you mean, save my leg? But they meant exactly what they said. There was so much damage the dog had chewed my calf over and over to the point where in the end the doctors wouldn't be able to save my leg and that's the night that I had my left leg amputated just below the knee May 3rd 2004 the night my entire life changed forever and that's where this story comes full circle I suppose 
I already told you how I live now. I can't work and I can't do much of anything anymore other than watch TV and help look after my mom. That pizza delivery job was the only real job I ever had in my life. The only one I didn't feel that was given to me out of charity anyway. There's a lot more legal things that went into it and it's still kind of ongoing here and there. But the trauma still lasts. All because of one dog. Back when I was 19, I was a pizza delivery guy for a small pizza place here in Medford, Massachusetts, and one night, I got a call that would turn out to be one of the scariest experiences of my life. I get handed the pizzas and the address, and when I drive over, I knock on the door and wait for someone to answer. Then, when this dude answers the door, he has this real shocked look on his face, and he's kind of swaying back and forth. I thought he might have been high at first, so I'm like, uh, you ordered a pizza, right? He responds by just coughing up blood all over my work shirt. I backed off like, oh my god, dude, are you okay? And he obviously wasn't because he immediately fell forward, like lunging at me and trying to grab onto me. I tried my best to catch him, dropping the pizzas in the process, but he fell on me so heavy that all I could do was stop him from falling hard on his face. I kind of let him down gently to the ground, and that's when I saw the thing in his back. I thought it was a knife at first, and I knew better than to try and pull it out, so I just backed off a little, pulled out my phone, and called 911. Then as I'm doing that, I looked up to see this woman emerging from a back room of the house. The look on her face is something that chills me to think about even today. I found out later that she and her boyfriend the guy with the knife in his back, had been having an argument, and when he'd gotten up to grab the pizza he'd ordered and told her she couldn't have any, she'd taken a wallpaper scraper of all things and plunged it so hard into his back that it punctured his lung. I don't know if she intended to come out and finish him off or whatever, but seeing me on the phone and obviously talking to the dispatcher must have made her come to her senses or whatever because she ran back into the back room and locked the door not coming out until the cops came to arrest her. That job was without a doubt the worst delivery I ever had to make, and it was definitely the single most shockingly terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button next to the subscribe button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, I'm watching you, Wazowski.